Um, I'm excited to be here tonight. I have um, raising the cat here with me and uh, my dog just put out somewhere. Um, so hopefully we'll get a good group on tonight and I was going to my computer back and it's too dark up here. Um, when you get on, a reminder, um, please put your name and either state or country so that I can enter you in for the drawing. Um, that we'll do about seven um, and then I'm happy to stay on later and answer more questions if um, people have more questions. Hello Anita. So if you see me looking away it's just because I'm writing names down and I'm going to turn the fan off really quick. That one. Okay. Just making sure all my dogs have their two items so that Jade was laying there or laying there. Hey, uh uh uh. That's not yours. There's nothing yours. Okay. 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 Sorry about that. I was just trying to alleviate a little resource guarding issue. They all have the exact same shoe item, but they always want what the other one has. Um, okay. Kim. Marion, Illinois. So I live in Marion, um, but I live in Marion, Utah, which is usually not even on most maps. Um, the closest town is Camas or Oakley. But yeah, I live. I actually live in a little town named um, called Marion. Mary, I'm gonna write down as many names as I can right now, and then we can get started. Hi, Aislinn. Oh, it's so nice of you to jump on. She's from Ireland, as you can see, and. Um, so yeah, even just jumping on and saying hi, I will still enter you in to the in the drawing. So no worries. If you have to go to bed, I fully understand. I can't remember the last time that I stayed up till midnight. Hey Emily, Virginia, Aisling. Am I saying your name right? I just want to make sure. Um, oh, thanks, Julie. Actually, I've been working all day and it was in a ponytail and I have a headache. So I took the ponytail out because I think it was making my headache worse. So this is actually messy ponytail hair. But it's like whatever. Okay, Julie. Destiny. I love that we get so many people return from week to week. That means you guys aren't sick of me yet. So I love it. Um, so let me close this thing. Okay. Oh, Marion is five hours south of Chicago. I don't think I've ever been um, Chicago. I'm trying to think if I've even had a layover in Chicago. I don't think so. There, there. We were going to have a dog training conference in Chicago, um, but I can't go, so I might have to do um, do it like via Zoom or something if they're offering that. Okay. Um, let's see. Where am I? Destiny. Hi, Destiny. I've got you, um, Marion. Marianne, we were just talking about Marianne, only the cities or the towns, not the name. And Marianne's also from Utah. Zero the hero. I love it. Um, Michael. Yay, we have a man. So I'm doing this from my house tonight. Um, 
just because last week um, the reception wasn't great and you guys said that you can hear and understand better when I'm home, which is actually kind of amusing to me because I'm not a techie person at all. So when things don't go right, I don't know how to fix it. But at my house, I actually don't have internet. Um, so I use my phone as a hotspot, but at my office, I actually have real live good internet. So the fact that it works better at my house than it does there is kind of amusing to me. But yeah, that's why I, I don't like um, technology. Yeah, it would be it would be weird hearing your name as a city. Um, yeah, I, I agree. Um, okay, let's see. I got Michael. Welcome, Michael. We always love it when men come. We don't we don't get nearly enough. We always joke that um, it's the women training the dogs because they're the ones that always um, that join on our lives. Okay, so I've got on so far. So um, let me know if you have any questions. Until we get questions, I'm going to kind of let you know what's going on in my house right now, just because I get this question asked a lot. Um, while I'm doing the live, I actually have my old cat on the couch, um, but I have three of the wood. I bought these wood chews um, at Petco because everybody, my dogs love to chew on wood chips or like, you know, anything that has to do with wood. So they had these wood, um, here, I'll show you one. So it's, they're, I mean, they're pretty tough. It's called pet stages, and you can see that the end of it is chewed up. My dogs have actually had these for about a month. So they're for super chewers, um, but it, I guess it has the feel or the taste or something of wood. It doesn't really smell like wood. Um, but all three of my dogs have the exact same thing, but um, Daphne had one that it looked like Jade was going to take it so I went and got Jade one and now Daphne is staring at Jade like she hers and it's like you have the exact same thing if I just get that here here get your chewy it's so funny that they're they're just like kids it's like they want what the other one has so it's crazy you don't want it now because Jade has another one I know you just silence my phone. Okay. Um, okay, Julie. So for cross season, I started puppy to the field. It has a lot of distractions. How can you focus on me when I try to teach her not to focus on the players? Um, that's a great question. One thing to be careful of, and Julie, I can't remember how old your puppy is, but um, I, I heard this in podcast week which was really good information because we used to do this thing in puppy class called pass the puppy where you know you'd have your puppy and pass it one to the right and so it was a socialization exercise where you could um, socialize you know get your dog used to, to different people but now um, like with fear periods and stuff we okay seven months um, so yeah, so you don't need to worry about like exposing your dog to like too many people at one time because that can actually be flooding. So if you take your dog, like say you have like a 14 week old puppy and you take them to like a soccer game and everybody is like coming up and wanting to handle the puppy, that can actually be really scary for some dogs. Um, and so we want to let the the dog decide if they want to go up and say hi to the person. So um, when you said lacrosse, that just made me think of that. But if you're at seven months, I would still like, you know, ask people to just um, allow your dog to go say hi to them. You can give them a few treats and let them hold their hand out and see if your puppy wants to come and take the treat from them. And if, if, um, if she does great, um, 
yeah, her. Okay, I want to make sure I have the sex right. Um, but always give her the option to back away if she's like, no, I don't want to see you, I don't want to say hi, stuff like that. Um, so one thing that you can do, and is it is really hard with that many distractions to get um, your dog to focus on you. Um, hey, Jay. Come here, guys. I left the laundry room door open because the cat was in there, like, searching for. So let me go close that door real quick because that's where the dog food is. Just a sec. Hey, hey, come here. Come on, Sorry about that. Um, the, the cat likes to mount in the laundry room, and so I sometimes leave the door open for him so he can hunt in there. And that's also where the dog food is kept. So two of my dogs just um, went in there to try and sneak up some extra food. Um, okay, so one thing that you can do with your dog is I would armed with really high value treats and when your dog like checks in with you on her own put it in treats and have something high value like the salmon treats or hot dogs or cheese or something like that so um the more distractions you have remember that it's going to be harder for your dog to focus so um i will do this thing with jade whenever we go to like a new place to practice um I'll have super high value treats and every single time she looks and checks in with me, I click and treat. So I'm actually catching her doing good things. Um, and if there's a lot of people and players that might be um, like too distracting for a seven month old, because remember, um, when you practice at home, that's like preschool. And then maybe in your yard is elementary school and then you can move up to middle school high school college so at, at a lacrosse practice with a lot of people and a lot of players that could be a college level when your dog is still maybe in elementary school if that makes sense so sometimes it is harder for dogs to focus i mean jay's two years old well she's over two now and i have a hard time getting her to focus when we go in a new store for the very first time so I will just like, um, when she like checks in with me, I'll click and treat. Um, I'll also try and do like a watch me um, so that she gives me eye contact. So I put it on cue um, and, and things like that. So I would say maybe try higher value treats. And also um, sometimes dogs don't generalize from one place to another. So with focus, sometimes you have to go back to like just playing the name game, saying your dog's name, click and treat. Um, and then click and treat when your dog gives you eye contact, things like that. So you almost start out as if it was a brand new puppy, um, but it should, she should catch on quicker every place that you go, if that makes sense. Um, so I would start off with just like playing the name game, playing, you know, doing watch me, um, rewarding her for getting eye contact. Um, one thing I started to do with Jay, let's see if I can get Jade up on the couch. So, wait, his razor's on. Um, so I I use a martingale um, collar on her now, but I have the chain one, and I kind of. In a way, I don't like it because I don't like it to look like I'm using a choke chain on my dog. But when when she's really distracted and and kind of not paying attention, on her leash, I just give her leash a little finger so it makes a little noise, and it just kind of gets her to focus back on me. So it's just like a little reminder, like oh hey, you're supposed to be focusing, and then she hears that the little noise from her collar, and then. She'll focus on me and then I'll reward. So you could try something like that too. Um, but again, remember that you have a young puppy and being at lacrosse could be like too much too soon. So always keep that in mind. Um, so to start with, I would just reward every time your dog checks in with you on her own, 
So then she knows that, oh, when I check in with mom, I get rewarded. So then she'll do more of that. That's a good, really good question though. Um, okay, Marion, separation anxiety. I'm still working on leaving for um, for second, then reward, continue for longer time reward, rinse and repeat. I also have bones, Kong stuff, puzzles. Um, and Mary, remind me, are you doing this in a crate or outside of a crate? Because the latest book that I've read, oh, it's actually right here. Um, I'm almost done with it. I'm not all the way through. So I read her first book on separation. She's like the separation anxiety um, guru. And she wrote a book, but these are new, new protocols now. Um, and some interesting new stuff is that now they're doing it outside of a crate, um, which if you have a dog that destroys and like chews the stuff and you have to leave, I would definitely use a crate. Um, but they have found that that with bones, Kongs, puzzles, like it keeps the dog under threshold and it keeps the dog pretty calm until that is gone. And then once the Kong is, is gone, or they found all the treats and the puzzles, um, then their anxiety comes back. Then they realize, oh my gosh, like mom's not here. And so they have found that those kind of don't work well um so i would do more of a um like mat work like teaching your dog to like go to a mat and relax and then do it um and i can't remember if we talked about this but you also want to work on hey daphne that's not yours come here not yours um you also want to work on um like departure cues. So like walk to the door, touch the doorknob, and then don't leave. And then turn the doorknob, and then unturn it, walk away. And your dog can walk to the door with you and um, kind of you see that you're, you're doing things that you would normally do when you leave, but you're not actually going to leave. Um, and then you can like open the door, close it, walk away. So your dog's actually out of a crate, doesn't have a chew item, and then you can like open the door, walk out, close the door, open it, come back in. Um, so I would actually try to do it without having any distractions, but as, okay, I'm gonna take this away. Sorry, I'm trying to prevent any fighting between dogs over a bone. Hey, it's all fine, it's all fine. You guys go do something else. Here. Okay. Um, so I would practice it without any distractions like that with bones or Kongs or, or anything like that. And just let your dog learn how to relax, like relax on a mat, relax on a bed, um, and then have you walk to the door, open it, um, and then like walk out, walk back in, things like that. So that the dog's actually learning how to be calm. Um, by him or herself, okay? Um, so that that's what, what I would do um, because the latest research has shown that once the dog finishes with whatever you've given them, then that anxiety is right back. So um, I know that Pubford has a really good separation anxiety course. Have you gone through that yet? Um, that might be worth checking out as well and, and seeing um, how she, like what protocol she use it to go through it. So she's chasing her tail right now. You guys are being very disruptive tonight. Um, I've been working all day. So this is like, they've just seen me for the first time after a long day. So they're kind of like wound up. Hey, you guys are gonna go on time out in a minute. Now you guys be good. And they've decided that it's play time. Okay. Uh, Mary, my dog eats anything she finds on a walk and will not drop it. I have tried chicken and cheese, but nothing works to get her to drop it. Um, okay, that could be good. Have you tried like trays? So when I teach drop it, I will teach a tray. So if, if, um, 
Maddie had, let's say she has her pen, my pen in her mouth. I would give her a high value treat. And I usually use salmon treats when I'm doing trays. And so I would offer her a salmon treat and say, drop it. And then she would drop this. I would give her the salmon treat, but then I would give this back. So I use, I usually start it with a toy or something. And so in her mind, it's like, oh, okay, we're trading. I'm giving, you're giving me a salmon treat. And then I get the original item back. So I would start with like a toy or a treat or something like that. And, um, and like have her give something up get the treat and then give it back. And so you're just trading back and forth. And then on walks, if it's something that um, you don't want your dog to have, then you still offer the treat, but then you just like keep the item and you don't trade. So sometimes the dog gets the original item back and sometimes they don't. Um, you might try, wow, if chicken and cheese don't work, that's pretty high value. You might have to go to like hot dogs or bacon, my, my go-to is always bacon. Um, or the salmon treats, I use the pup for salmon treats a lot just because I have found that this, the more smelly something is, the more dogs like it. Um, so, you know, you might try that, but, but whenever I'm teaching a drop it, I will teach trays first. So it's kind of like, um, I know I've used this analogy before, but if you lend your car to somebody and they bring it back, they return it with a full tank of gas and fully detailed, you're like, oh, heck yeah, take my car anytime because it comes back better. So, and the dog gets to decide um, how much value something is. So to us, we might think that chicken, chicken and cheese is the best thing ever. But if your dog is picking up like a leaf and your dog loves leaves, and that's better to your dog than chicken or cheese, then we have to find something else that the dog, it has to be of equal or higher value to what the dog has. So if they pick up, um, well, like I took Jay to a restaurant one time and somebody had, um, I think spilled half of their takeout on the ground and there was nothing that I had that was going to equal um, or be better than what she found on the ground. But by time I tried to, you know, get her to leave it or drop it, she'd already eaten it. So, you know, sometimes it's too well. But, um, you know, if your dog picks up rocks or something like that, I would think that any kind of food would be a rock. Um, however, like I said before, dogs love wood chips. They love, you know, bark, stuff like that. So if that's really high value to your dog, um, sometimes we do kind of like a taste test where you try different things and find out what your dog really loves. Like this one right here, she will do anything for a boring milk bowl. But she's on prednisone and she is hungry all the time and she loves food. So I can get her to do anything for just about any bit of food. However, when we are out in public with Jade and Jade is super distracted, um it's going to take a lot more than milk bones i have to use something higher value to keep her attention um and to reward her for stuff because the distractions going on in her environment are they're they're too much for just like regular treats so i have to use something higher value so i would try the teaching the trays and then play around with different treats um and see what your dog like thinks is like the best thing ever. And um, like I said, play around with like hot dogs. I hate cutting up hot dogs. I think it's disgusting, but they work really well um, for high value treats. So you can try that. And then every time I go to the um, diner, I always get a side of bacon in the box and um, I use that for my high value treat for like recall, leave it, um, stuff like that. So I hope that answers your question. Um, okay, both in crate and also just leaving a room or front door. Two puppies, one seven months, another five months. Oh, you are, you are um, brave to do two puppies. Okay. Um, 
So, yeah, you can totally do it in a crate. In fact, if you have puppies, I would because they're um, – they're probably still like in the chewing phase and may not be totally um, potty trained. So I would actually teach them how to just be calm in their crate without, without an item so that you leave, come back. Um, there is a new, in fact, I think it was the same podcast that I was listening to. And it's about teaching puppies how to just kind of settle. Um, and if Marion, if you email me at it's Tracy with an I at pupford.com, I can send you that puppy protocol on just teaching puppies to settle. Um, so I I would start that. It's kind of like mat work, like just teach them to go to go to their mat or go to their crate and just kind of how to, how to chill. And then. Um, and then you could start doing the departure cues and then start leaving and coming back and doing that kind of stuff. Um, and with puppies too, you could, you could, you know, put them in their crate and then like walk outside, come back in. And then like walk outside, get the mail, come back in. And, um, and then kind of increase the, the time. So now I get why you're giving them like a chew item or something like that. But yeah, then when it's gone, they realize that they're, that they're alone. I had a puppy board and train with me last week and um, they, you know, it was a COVID dog that um, the parent, the owners actually had not left alone. And so when it came, or when it came, when it came to my house, um, you know, I, I require all dogs to be crate trained because I'm gone all day and my yard is not small dog proof. Like they can fit through the holes. Um, so, you know, they have to be in a crate during the day. And this dog would cry and cry and cry. Um, but then by the end of the week, he got used to like, okay, I'm going in my crate. Um, he would cry like when I would just first leave. And then I would come back and like, you know, listen at the door and he was already calm. So it took about three or four days for him to get used to being crate trained again and that he was going to go in his crate, but I was going to come back. So, um, so yeah, I would, I would try that. But if you email me, I will send you that, um, that trade protocol for, for puppy um, settling. Okay, Myrna. Oh, let me go back to Marion. Yeah, check out the course. Because um, I, I think that that separate anxiety course will, will really help you out a lot. And I know a lot of trainers like specialize in separation anxiety and it's really expensive. So if you can like, you know, get a course for whatever they sell the courses for, which I don't think is very much, I think that will really help a lot. Um, okay, my Boston Terrier is deaf and she's very smart, but hasn't stopped biting my hands and thinks it's a game. She gets too excited and seems aggressive. Um, okay, so um, what I do is I have what's called a three bite strike rule and you can do this even with a deaf dog. So the first time they bite, then I redirect to a toy. So it's like, and you can even do something like put your hands up without saying they're like too hard, just like putting your hands up and then give your dog a toy and, and engage her with a toy. So it's like, yeah, you can't chew on me, but here's a toy you can chew on the toy. Um, and then if she gets too excited and goes back to chewing on your hands, then strike two is you calmly pick her up, put her in a crate with a toy so that it's not a punishment and you leave her in there for one to two minutes um, just to like calm down and then let her out. And then if she comes back to biting again for a third time, then it's back in the crate um, and then cover the crate and leave her in there until um, 
like for an hour or just like let her have a nap. So that gives her time to like nap and decompress and it gives you a break from the biting. Because a lot of times when they get overly excited and seem aggressive, it's just because like they need a break, they need a nap, they need to decompress. So, you know, then you just cover the crate and like let them have some chill time. And I think you can do all of that with being deaf too. I, I had a, I've trained two deaf dogs now and I used to do this for like, uh-uh. So that was my interrupter for like, that meant, uh-uh. And so like, if your dog's biting too hard, you could do that, like, you know, hands up and then uh-uh-uh, and then redirect to a toy. And then again, second time, um, crate for one to two minutes and then third time crate for a long time because the, the dog needs a break. They're kind of like the those kids that get like really hyper and almost bratty and then right before they like fall asleep. So Maddie and Jade. They're like sitting there so intent. What are you guys they're both on the couch because Raisin, the cat, is on the other side and the dogs are afraid of Raisin. My three scary pit bulls are afraid of my 19-year-old decrepit falling apart cat. It's, a, it's actually pretty funny. Raisin's asleep. Um, so, yeah, great question. Um, I have, so Marion, Jade's kind of a Velcro dog. Um, she follows me around the house. Um, when I go to bed, she goes to bed. The other two girls will will just come to bed later. Um, but yeah, she's like glued to me all the time. However, I can leave and leave her in a crate and she's fine. So I'm very lucky about that. Um, Anthony. Oh, Anthony's back. Hi, Anthony. Let me write your name down for the... And Anthony, if I remember right, are you from California? Can't remember for sure. So correct me if I'm wrong, just so I can enter you. Um, okay, I'm moving to another home with my husky. Is it difficult to transition dogs from home to home? That that's a good question. Um, I have lived in the same house for over 30 years, so I couldn't tell you. However, when I was newly married, I had a dog that we did bring up where I'm living now from an apartment, and he did just fine. Like, it was fine for him. Um, I always give them a few days to, like, settle in, get used to their new um, environment. Um, one of the things that I like to do is, oh, California, I got it right. I'm always so happy when I actually get something right. Um, so I teach him like where I want them to go potty or like what door to let me know that they need to go potty and just kind of like a new puppy, just get on a routine. So new house, like we're going to get up. This is the door we're going to go out to and go potty. Um, then we're going to eat. Then we're going to go for a walk. But yeah, it's usually a pretty easy transition. Um, mainly potty training is the only issue because now they're in a new place and they may not know like, okay, where do I go potty? So that's usually what I start with. Um, and then the rest of it goes pretty easy. So the more of a routine you have, the better, um, and the easier it will be for your dog to transition. So you're going to be doing like the same things. So remember dogs like predictability. So it's like, oh, I'm in a new place, but okay, we still go potty first and then I eat or I get a puzzle toy and then we we do enrichment, we go on a walk, we do this. So it's just predictable for the dog. And and that really um hi Julie. So let me write Julie down. That noise in the background is all three dogs drinking out of the same water thing at the same time. Okay. 
Um, okay, any other questions? No. Sorry, I drink like water all day long and I'm still always thirsty. Plus I talk a lot because I'm with clients all day and then I do this and then I teach classes. So I always feel like I never get enough water. Um, oh, okay. what are the best colors for her? Luna actually slipped out of her harness and ran. Oh, such a good question. Okay, so, Jay. Woman to mirror, my little girl. So this is a um, martingale. And what it does is it tightens just enough so that they can't slip out of it, but it doesn't choke them. So like I said, if you didn't hear earlier, I'm not a big fan of this just because it looks like a choke collar, but it, it is a martingale. And I, and I have the chain part because I use the sound of it to get her attention when we're out working. But this will tighten so that they can't slip out of it. Um, the other one that I use with Jade is a Freedom Harness. Um, so if you're looking for just a collar, I would totally go with Martingale because they're like the dots can't slip out of them. Um, and then I also use a um, Freedom Harness for her as well, which she doesn't have on right now, but it's um, it's got um, the Martingale thing on the back of it, and it's got the two clips, the one in the back, one in the front. Um, and if the dog kind of like tries to back up, the one in the back kind of tightens, and so they can't slip out of it. I've actually never had a dog get out of, of a Freedom Harness. So you can get those from Pupford. They sell them now. Um, and... I think that they're the best. I use those for all three of my pit bulls. And when I have clients with really strong dogs, um, I always recommend that they get um, the Freedom Harness because it's an anti-pull harness as well. So the front clip makes it so that the dog, um, you know, if they pull, it turns them back towards you, but it also has the, the Martindale thing on the back. But if you want just a collar, I would, I would get this. So, yeah, that's what I use. Um, I had, I did have a dog once that slipped out of her harness. It wasn't a freedom harness, though, and she slipped out and took off. And it luckily, there was somebody walking with a dog, and so she ran right up to the dog. And so I'm like, oh, my gosh, can you pick her up? And so the lady picked her up, and then I was able to get her back. So, yeah, that's scary when they do that. And that's probably why... Now I use mostly martingale collars or freedom harnesses just so my dogs can't like slip out of anything. Um, Aaron, okay. Our dog freaks out when meeting new people, pulls and whines because she is so excited. Um, so I like to teach, I mean, if it's a, if it's a really young puppy, um, you do want to teach impulse control, but at the same time you, um, you want them to like people and to want to go see people. So usually um, I'll ask the dog to like sit and wait and then say, okay, go say hi. So they give me a little bit of impulse control and then um, and then they, they can go say hi. So I don't like, I mean, I don't like dogs to like pull and whine, but at the same time, um, we do want to socialize them and we want them to be excited about meeting new people. So I'll usually like ask for like a sit, um, wait, and then say, okay, go say hi. So I only wait like a second or two just, just to teach that little bit of impulse control. But I think the more important thing is like letting your dog like socialize with, with other people. Now, if your dog is older, and like already well socialized with people, then I teach I teach a longer like sit and wait. And then as the person approaches, if your dog pulls, then then I'll turn and go the other direction. Or you can set it up to where you have people help you with this and you can tell them if if my dog pulls or gets up 
to, to greet you before I release her, then I want you to step away. So that pulling and whining makes the person go away, but sitting and waiting makes the person come closer and then pets the dog and gives them a treat or whatever. So I like to teach a sit and a wait for that. And that's actually the first, um, the first part of the CGC test is sit and wait um, while somebody approaches and says, hi, can I pet your dog? And then they sit politely for petting. So it's just, it's just that, um, that impulse control thing that you can teach. So it's kind of like, I know you don't want to wait, but if you sit and wait, then you get to say hi, and then you get what you want. But you just have to do this one little thing first. So I would do that. Um, I do have a handout on PT and wait too, if you want it, just email me and I, I'll send it to you. Um, Danny, oh, we have somebody from Australia today. That's awesome. Let me write you down. So Danny, just so you know, um, I, my Siri, you know, like with your phone, when you say, hey, Siri, and they talk to you and give you directions. Um, mine is the Australian guy. It's the male with the Australian accent. That's who, oh, my phone just beeped because, um, because I said, hey, Siri. But yeah, I have just the Australian guy. So. Anyway, uh, my eight-month-old desex female lab cross poodle is being dominant over my six-year-old Maltese. Um, he is scared of her and hides under the furniture all day when I'm not around. They interact quite well other times and walk together on lead and he licks her face while we're out walking. Um, so I'm going to give you my... Um, my dominant feel. So the word dominant is is very um, fluid. And so it depends on the situation. So as an example, um, if there is a piece of kibble on the floor and two dogs go for it at the same time, if you know, Jade will probably growl because she wants it. And if Daphne backs away and says, okay, you can have it, then in that instance, um, Jade was dominant because she's like, she does resource guard food. Now, when she was just laying right here on the bed and she was eating her, her chewy thing and Daphne walked right up to her, she didn't growl, she didn't do anything. And so in that, in that sense, neither dog was dominant because they, you know, they didn't really care about that resource, even though Jade was chewing on it. Um, let's say that Maddie's on the couch and Jade comes to get on the couch and Maddie growls. And so Jade backs off. So in that case, Maddie's dominant. So it always depends. So it can change and it depends on the resource. So dogs can, can, um, can be, um, like can guard like food or toys or sleeping areas or couches or things like that. Um, so when you say that your female is being dominant, um, like tell me what that looks like, like what specifically is going on. It could be that your, your female dog is eight months old, so you now have a teenager that's trying to push the limits, and then you have an older dog that's a Maltese. So it could be just that your poodle is kind of being a bully um, and is trying to see like what what she can get away with because you know now she's getting because you know how teenagers are at least I was like this we always like push the limits to see what we could get away with um, we didn't do anything bad just kind of like toilet paper the neighbor's house or you know something like that but. Um, yeah, so you have a teenage adolescent dog that's going to try and push the boundaries. Um, if your Maltese is afraid of your poodle, though, um, I would kind of advocate for him and maybe put him in a safe place during the day. Because if he's hiding under furniture all day when you're not around, um, that's, that's kind of sad for him. And just think, like, he's probably very anxious and nervous. 
So having a safe place for him to go, like another room or a crate, like a cozy crate. I mean, I have a huge crate right here, and the door is always open. And right now, Daphne's just in there on her own. And sometimes the other dogs go in with her as well. Um, so just have a crate for him and maybe his own room so that he can be relaxed and not have to hide under the furniture. You know, plus your lab poodle is probably bigger than a Maltese, um, depending on what your Maltese is crossed with. Um, so if your poodle's like, you know, at eight months old is playing rough or um, even being a little bit of a bully, then the smaller dog is going to go hide. So I, I would try and separate them during the day when you're not around. Because it sounds like when you are around, they do really well. Like they walk together um, and things like that. So unfortunately, if you're not home, there's really nothing you can do. Because you're not home to interrupt. If you're home and you see the poodle like um, being too rough or bullying or doing something that may look like dominant, then you can interrupt and say, hey, uh, 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 and um, then like you can send them both to their crate or both to a mat or both, you know, give them both something else to do. But, but at the very least, like interrupt the poodle um, from whatever she's doing to the Maltese, like interrupt that behavior and then redirect to something else, if that makes sense. So it's like right now, I don't know if you were on, but I could see an accident waiting to happen because there was um, one, I mean, there was three bones out here, but all dogs were like wanting the same one. And so I just picked it up and put it away until I'm done with this because I want to give you guys my undivided attention and I didn't want to keep watching the dog. So in that case, like I interrupted, took away the resource and now they're all like, they're all laying down somewhere around the house, except these right here. So um, yeah, when you're home, if you see something happen, I would interrupt and then um, redirect the poodle. Like, you know, go do a down stay on your bed or you know, do something that, that's not being um, like obnoxious to the Maltese, if that, if that makes sense. And so teach, teach the poodle like what you want the dog to do instead. Um, and then I think as time goes by, as your poodle gets a little bit older and more mature, um, she may stop, you know, like bugging the Maltese so much. I know last week I had a puppy board and train and um, Jade loved like chasing this little dog around and they did play, they played really well, but I had to keep interrupting her and just saying, Hey, like easy. She's like, this dog's 10 pounds. Like be a little bit easy. Like she's used to playing with pit bulls and dogs that play rough. So, you know, I had to keep interrupting her and like having her settle down a little bit before she would go back and play and give the puppy a little break and time out because, um, you know, Jade was a lot bigger than him, and they were having fun, but when I thought it was too rough, then I would interrupt from a break and then let him go back to play. Um, okay, Nicole from Oklahoma. I'm going to write your name down really fast. Give me one second while I... I need to plug in my computer. It's going to die. With so many um, animals running around, they keep on plugging my stuff. So, okay, my rescue husky moves I have had for two weeks. He occasionally has accidents. When I find them, I just go to clean it up and don't say anything, um, which is good. That's the right thing to do. Um, but I notice that he seems scared while I'm cleaning it up. Um, yeah, so you go to, and it, it could be um, that he was punished for having accidents in the house before you rescued him. So if he was punished for it before, he 
he could associate like whenever I see somebody cleaning something up, then I get in trouble. So um, I actually do the same thing. I don't want to um, reinforce like potting in the house, but like Maddie is on prednisone and she's 11. So she has accidents sometimes, sometimes at night and I don't catch her doing it. And so like, you know, she'll kind of look embarrassed when I'm cleaning it up and I'll just say, you know, Maddie, it's okay. I understand. Um, it's not a big deal. It's fine. Like, I don't want to go over the top and like baby them because yeah, you're right. You don't want to reinforce the pottying, but really you're not reinforcing it because it's happening after the fact. So, um, if you do catch your dog going, um, then I would just interrupt. And since it's a rescue that seems to be a little bit more fearful, um, and, and could possibly have gotten punished for potting in the house. I would, I would just do an interrupter like, like, Oh, Hey, Hey, um, outside, let's go outside. And just, I usually clap my hands, but maybe with moose don't clap as loud. Um, so like just interrupt and then take her outside and then give her a lot of praise for going outside. But, um, yes, when, when you find an accident that happened before and you're just cleaning it up, you can say, oh, it's okay, man, it's not a big deal. Um, you know, I should have been watching or whatever. And just the tone of your voice is going to let um, Moose know that it's, you know, that he's not in trouble. So, uh, yeah, and, and if you've only had um, him for two weeks, um, it's going to take him a little bit of time to, like, settle in and, um, whenever I bring home new rescues or fosters, I usually have accidents like the first two weeks while they're figuring it out. Um, and then once he figures out that he's at a safe in a safe place and that he's like not going to be punished and things like that, then then he'll he'll start to trust you more. The best thing that you can do is just like I said, get on a routine. Um, as far as first thing in the morning, we go potty and then I'm going to feed you breakfast and then we're going to go potty a half hour later. Um, and then we're going to do a snuffle mat or we might go for a walk or we might do a little training session. So just so that he gets on a structure and a routine and he knows what to expect. So when he does have accidents, the fact that you're not yelling at him and punishing him, he's going to learn that if I have accidents, I'm not going to get yelled at. But in the meantime, take him out more often. And just, you know, when you take him outside, let's say, let's go potty. Come on, go potty. And then make sure that you really reward him for going potty outside. But I think you're, I think you're doing great. Um, it can, it, a lot of times it's so hard with rescues because we don't know what their background is and we don't know, you know, I, I had one dog that I, I know was abused. His, I mean, he was a little hot mess, but he was such a cute little dog. He was actually a little pit bull um, Chinese crested hairless that had been abused. And so it was really hard. And one of the things that I had to do was, was right up front was let him know that he was safe, that nothing bad was going to happen to him. Um, even when I was petting him, like if I would get down towards his bottom area, he would turn around and like snap at me because I think he'd been spanked or kicked or something like that. So it will take um, a little bit for him to, you know, learn that, that you're not going to abuse him or punish him. Um, oh, she's a year and a half. My kids taught her to be excited to greet them. Yes. Yeah, so that, you know, so then you have learning history that goes into that. So I am, I'm at fault for doing the same thing with Jade. So when I come home and I'm trying to teach her not to jump on people, um, cause she gets super excited when she meets people too. Only she, she doesn't pull her wine. She just jumps. But when I come home, you know, she's like jumping on me and she's like super excited. And I'm like, Oh, hi Jade. I missed you. And so it's my fault that she jumps because you know, I did miss her and I'm saying hi, and but I will ask her to sit. I'll say, oh, can you sit for me? And then I'll continue to pet her. Um, so that's one of the issues. So like if, if 
if kids have taught her to be really excited, then to her, um, that's how she greets people is to be really excited. So now we have to teach the dog to like sit and wait to greet. So like with your kids, I would start practicing a sit and a wait. So like this would be a sit and a wait. And then it's like, oh, hi, Jay, good girl. And then I would pet her and say hi. And then you can transfer that over to other people. So you sit and wait to say hi. And we actually practice that a lot when we're out working. Um, when people say, oh, she's so cute, can I say hi? And she has a service dog in training vest on. Um, but I let people pet her. And I'll say, you can pet her as long as she's sitting. And so I'll ask her to sit. And then she can sit nicely and greet people and let them pet her. So, yeah, I would, I would do that. Um, let's see, Anita, when my dog sees someone, um, she wants to play, um, with, she's so excited. As soon as she's released, she runs full speed and almost knocks a person down. So again, I would kind of do, I wouldn't release, I wouldn't release her until she's up closer to the person. So it's like, okay, we are, we're going to like calmly walk up to the person and then you're going to sit and then I'm going to release you and you can say hi. Um, so that, that she's not like running up and knocking somebody down. And you can teach a dog like how to greet people. So like instead of like running full speed, like you'd have to do it on leash first, but let's practice like walking up to a person and saying hi. Um, and you know, teach that, that kind of thing. So, you know, impulse control exercises, um, like wait and stay and, you know, wait to greet somebody um, and walk nicely up to greet somebody rather than like running at them full speed. I've had dogs run at me full speed and like kick me out at the knees. So, um, yeah, I would keep her on leash until the dog gets closer so that she can't like run full speed up and knock somebody down. Um, and then you can also, like, if she's pulling too much, turn the other direction and just say, oh, you're pulling. We're going to go this way. And then only when she's, like, showing some impulse control do you then walk closer to that person. Um, and if it's somebody that you know, you can say, like, if she starts to pull, I want you to back away. So the pulling makes the person go farther away, but her exercising impulse control and walking to the person results in her getting to say hi to the person. Does that make sense? Um, so showing some impulse control results in getting to say hi, but pulling or whining results in that person moving away. So that's what I would do. Um, oh, she herds him into the corner and stands over him aggressively the other day she attacked him. Um, okay, so yeah, that's that's more um, that's more. I wouldn't really say dominance, but like um, bullying or aggression. So if you see that happening, if you see um, your poodle hurting him over to the corner and then standing over him, I always interrupt that. I'll say, hey, uh, 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 and then send the poodle to a mat, like, okay, go to your mat and you chill. Um, and then, and then, yes, I would do the same thing too. Like when you're not home and you can't supervise, I would separate them. Like either with a baby gate or um, put them all teased in another room in a crate so that he is safe. But if you see her hurting him into a corner, um, and being kind of like a bully like that, then I would, I would totally like separate and maybe um, teach her. So there's um, a thing called a positive interrupter. And the way I teach it is I'll say like enough treat, enough treat, enough treat. And so the dog learns what the word enough means treat. So then if you see um, the poodle like going after the Maltese, you can say, hey, enough. And then your dog should like turn and look at you like, oh, I heard enough. That means treat. 
And it doesn't mean that you're rewarding that behavior. It just means you're interrupting it um, because you don't want to punish the poodle because then she could learn, like, I really hate this Maltese. It was like, kind of like growing up with my brother, who I love and adore now. But I was always getting in trouble because of him. And so I just, you know, I kind of resented him growing up because I was always getting in trouble. When instead, if my parents would have been like, oh, when you're, if you're really nice when your brother's around, we'll give you extra allowance or we'll let you stay out longer or do something like that, then I would probably like my brother more um, when I was a kid. So we don't want the poodle to associate any like punishment with the Maltese. So that's why you use a positive interrupter, like, okay, enough. And then you can send them, send the poodle to a mat or a bed with a chew item or something to do. So you positively interrupt and redirect and then send them to a mat or a crate or something like that. But yeah, I, I would definitely interrupt that. And then, um, and when she attacked him, was it, was it just like randomly out of the blue attacked him or did it have to do with food or an object or, or something like that? Um, because if, if she just kind of attacked out of the blue, you might want to work with a trainer in your area on some counter conditioning um, and, and things like that. So that we want to change her, um, like how she feels about the about the Maltese. Um, and again, you have an eight month old that that is, you know, a teenager and trying to push the boundaries. And it could be a matter of also now trying to figure out where she is in the social hierarchy. So it's like you have an older dog that's been there and now you have a new younger dog that now is going to try to push the boundaries. So um, she still needs to know like, hey, I'm the captain of the ship and and we're not going to have that in, in our house. And so you're going to interrupt and then send her to a mat to chill, so to speak. Um, so I hope, I hope that helps. I actually have a handout on positive interrupters that a friend and colleague of mine um, wrote up. It's, and I have permission from her to share it. So if you want to email me, I'll sell that, or I'll sell that. I will share that with you. I will send it to you. Um, no, you do not have to pay for it. But um, yeah, and I, I also do virtual consulting. So if you want me to help you like virtually, I can, I can do that. It might be easier if there's a trainer in your area um, that can like help. But if you don't have any science-based trainers, um, I'd be happy to set up like a, a virtual consult and um, and help you that way. But the first thing that we always want to do is environmental management. So that includes like baby gates. Um, you could tether the poodle to you um, so that she can't practice that behavior and can't hurt him or attack him. Um, and I would also, when she is interacting nicely with the Maltese, make sure you praise her and reward her like, oh, that was so good. Kind of like when my mom would say, oh, thank you for being nice to your brother. That was so nice of you. Um, and so then when I would get like recognized for being nice, um, I was more likely to be nice until I got in trouble again for picking on him or something. Um, so yeah, I would do the positive interrupter and, and redirect and then manage environment so she can't practice that. Um, okay, Nicole, even outside if he sees me look at MP, he will stop peeing. Um, yeah, so you can take him outside and just kind of like turn your back, turn sideways, look at him out of the corner of his eye, out of your eye, and then when he's done, you can say, oh, good potty, and then give him a treat. So it's funny. There are some dogs that just don't like you to watch them potty. And so I always have to just kind of turn and, and pretend like I'm not watching, but then I'll kind of look at him out of the corner of my eye and then reward. So um, 
Anita, yeah, due to Corona, I haven't allowed them to come within six to nine feet. Um, yeah, that's that's really hard with um, with Corona. This coronavirus has, you know, put a damper on a lot of training, which is why I am so busy right now because we're just dealing with separation anxiety and lack of socialization and stuff like that. Um, you can still like. Um, You know what you could do, Anita, is when your dog sees somebody, um, you can just like treat, like, oh, look, there's a person, treat, treat, like sit and watch me, treat. So reward them for being calm. And, um, and then when the person's like six feet away, if your dog's calm, then you can release them. Um, and you could even use a long line so that if, if your dog is like running too much or is like too excited, you still have some leash control and, you know, like easily and gently let your dog learn to how, how to go up and greet somebody. So yeah, I would use a long line or, um, or something like that. They're finally relaxing our rules with Corona here. So um, we're like, um, we, we can actually go back to church. Um, we do still wear masks in public. Um, I wear masks in people's houses if they want me to. So the, it is getting a little bit better, but yeah, it's still an issue, especially with dogs and socialization and stuff. Um, okay. Um, Denise, my dog has a dog friend that she loves. However, something when they play, the other dog will bite at her legs paws or mount her. Um, my dog is fearful and freezes a bit. We separate them immediately. And that's exactly what you want to do. Um, and then they go back to each other and are fine. Um, no, it sounds like just normal play. So um, when, when Jade and Daphne play, um, they will bite each other's feet and they go for the feet, um, which, which is fine. Like if the other dog doesn't like it, um, you know, if she like gives a correction, that's an appropriate correction. Now, when one dog mounts another, then I do interrupt and I'll say, hey, uh, 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 and I'll pull the dog off, um, give him a brief time out and then let him go back to playing. And we actually have to do that in puppy class a lot. So sometimes it's overstimulation. They just get too excited. Sometimes it's um, the dog's trying to figure out again, like they're, where they fit in their social hierarchy, which is not dominance, it's different. But um, so I always will interrupt that, pull the dog off, give him a one minute timeout and then let him go back and play. But it sounds like totally normal play. So for right now, I would say, no, you don't have to, to worry. But yes, definitely if the other dog mounts and your dog freezes. So when dogs are fearful, um, and they, they feel threatened or they're in a, um, like scary situation. They're either going to fight, flight or freeze. And it sounds like your dog freezes. I, my dog Daphne does the same thing. Like she'll just freeze if something happens. Um, Jade is more of the like feisty one that it'll be like, um, yeah, I'm going to eat you. And, you know, Maddie's just my chill girl that is my gentle giant, but you know, she will correct. Like if the dog comes up and, um, you know, tries to mount her or jump on her, she'll give him a correction, but that's as far as it goes. So you just, you have a dog that freezes. And so you just want to pull the other dog off, let him calm down and then let him go back and play. Um, okay. Anita, my granddaughter got bit by my neighbor's dog last week. What should I advise her to do? Hmm. So I always teach kids. Um, hang on, I'm gonna block this. Okay. Um, if a dog comes at her aggressively, I teach kids to um, be a tree. So I have them like stand really still hold in their branches and look at the sky and just be really, really still. 
a lot of kids, um, children like will scream or flail their arms or whatever, and that can amp up a dog or some dogs think that they're playing. Um, and then I also tell tell kids like don't put your hand out and and try and pet a dog like let the dog come up to you um, and see if the dog wants to interact because some dogs don't want to interact so if there's an aggressive dog that or if, if a strange dog just comes up I just tell them to stand stand still hold in the branches and look up and just be really still and the dog should just sniff and then walk away if um, we do this in schools too. So we do be a tree and be a rock. So then if they do get attacked, then we have the, the kids like get on the ground, um, like almost um, like on their knees and then they fold in their arms. So they're protecting their face and their ears um, and the back of their neck. And just be a rock and be really still until um, help comes or until the dog like moves away um and actually i i was terrified of dogs when i was younger and i got bit by a dog when i was young um and i turned out to be a dog trainer so just make sure that your granddaughter has other good experiences with dogs but teach her like what to do and what not to do with dogs like we don't ever want um young kids to like run up to a dog because we don't know if that dog is friendly or not so we always teach them um we actually practice this in schools where they'll you know we practice the kids coming up and saying hi can i pet your dog and then i say yeah um and then so like we teach them how to interact um and then we practice to be a tree and we practice to be a rock so and then just make sure she has other good experiences with dogs as well. Um, okay, my boss brings her adorable English bulldog puppy to work. When you take her for a walk, she bites the leash and pulls you. Um, so I would probably put her on a freedom harness um, so that um, she can't pull. Some things that you can do for pulling one is um, dropping treats in front of the dog. So that refocuses their attention. And first I start with, with every step. I drop a treat, take a step, drop a treat, take a step, drop a treat. So it slows the dog down because they're getting a treat. And then I'll go every two steps and then every three steps and then every four steps. So then I start to spread out the treats a little bit more. Um, so I'll do that. Another one that I do is change direction. So if the dog starts to pull, I'll turn and go the other way. And then as the dog runs to catch up, I will reward when they're like kind of by my side. For a dog that bites the leash, I just teach a drop it. So I have treats ready and I'll say drop it. And when I'm teaching drop it, I put the treat right in front of their mouth or their nose. And then they'll, when they drop the, the leash to get the treat, then I click and treat and then we go on our way. Once the dog knows drop it though, then I don't treat every single time. So I actually walk a dog that does this a lot and he'll like bite at the leash and want to play tug. So I just stop walking and I don't play tug and I don't engage. And I just stand still and I'll say drop it and then he'll drop it. And then when he's calm, we start our walk again. And then if he bites the leash and start like he gets super excited then I just stop I'll say drop it so nothing fun happens when he's biting and pulling on the leash um and I'll just stop walking tell him drop it and then when he's calm then we start walking again and then for the leash for the pulling I would use like a freedom harness um or try dropping treats in front of like right in front of the dog or try like changing directions because eventually um, dogs don't like having to constantly change direction and catch up with you so they learn in fact i did this with a dog a puppy just today and at the first of the walk he was pulling like crazy but i just kept like changing direction and then i was dropping treats in front of him and by the end of the walk he was like walking right by my side so they they catch on pretty pretty quick um as to like what's 
okay and what's not okay as far as leash walking. Um, okay, it's 7.15, so let's do a drawing. And then if anybody has any more questions, um, I'm happy to stay on and answer them. And if there aren't any questions, then I'll let you go till next week. So let me stick all your names in my um, bowl and draw. Okay, and tonight's winner is Kim Bray from Illinois. So congratulations, Kim. Um, and you can um, email Pupford at hello at Pupford.com and let them know what kind of treats you like or you want and they will send you a free bag of training treats and then I will I email them as well and let them know that you're our winner. So congratulations. Um, if there's a if there's a flavor that you haven't tried yet or if you haven't tried any of them, now's a chance to try them. So um, yeah, my, my dog's favorites are the salmon. Um, and those are the ones I use most for training um, just because they're, I think they, they smell more so, so dogs really like them. So that's what I use the most of, but they're all good. My dogs love all of them. So I keep like all flavors on hand, but I think I use the um, salmon ones the, the most. So, um, yes, Kim, you won. You won the drawing. Um, so, yeah, you can, you just want a free bag of training treats. So you email at hello at pupford.com and let them know what flavor you want, and I will email them as well, and they will send those out to you. So congrats. Um, yep, and Julie's dog loves the salmon as well. I love it when I go into, like, people always ask me, um, you know, what kind of treats are you using? So I always, when I'm doing training plans, I give them a link to Pupford so that they can get their snuffle mats, their, um, it's like this place is one-stop shopping. Um, so it's like you can get your snuffle mat, your freedom harness and your treats and then I walked in these one people's house and they had like five bags of treats like they ordered a whole bunch so I love it um yes you're welcome congrats um so do we have any more questions if we don't um then I'll let you guys go for for tonight if there's any handouts or anything that you wanted here let me type my email in here um so if you wanted the puppy um relaxation i can send that to you for the one that wanted the positive interrupter i can send you that um it might take me a couple days but i'll get it to you as soon as i can so just to help you out with your training okay doesn't look like we have any more tonight so I'll let you guys go. Have a great week. Thanks for putting up with my little bit of chaos that I'm having here with three dogs and a cat. They haven't seen me all day, so they were they're a little bit like high strung right now. Um, you're welcome. I love doing these, so I hope you guys get as much out of it as I I love doing it. So this is like the highlight of my week. Um, Oh, the tree and the rock. I don't have those in handout. Um, let me see if I can find it. There used to be, because it's part of the school program. And so I think I've seen a website or something with it before. Um, so let me look and see if I can find a handout on that. We just kind of demonstrated it um, to the kids and then we had them practice. So let me let me see what I can find. And if I can find something, I will like I will let you know. Um, if I can't find a handout, I can always make I can always just videotape like me doing it so I can show you like 
what to do and then have your granddaughter, have your grandkids practice it. Because that's what we did in the school. Um, we just had them all stand up. So I would say, okay, everybody stand up and show me your best tree. And then they would stand up still, cross their arms and look up. And then I said, okay, everybody be a rock. And they'd get down on the ground. So they're actually down on their knees and they're like curled up and they put their hands like this. So their head is down into their knees and they're covering their face and their ears and their neck. And we tell them just to stay there. Because if they run or scream, um, it's going to amp up the dog more. So we just want them really still and protect themselves. So, um, yeah, I will look and see if I can find anything on that. It's been a while since I've done the school program. So, and when I did that, I worked at the rescue. So if there were things, they were, they were there at the rescue. But we never really handed out anything to the kids. Um, we just like had them practice. So, but I'll see if I can find um if i can find something you might even just google um like dog program um be a tree and something might pop up because i think that's how i originally got it as well um but if you can't find anything or if i can't find anything let me know and i can just send you a videotape like video just with the phone and i can send it to you that way and then you can practice um Okay, great questions tonight, everybody. Thank you for joining me. And I'll see you next Wednesday, same time. Um, and everybody have a great week.